Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, guys and girls, brothers and sisters, welcome to Freshly Grounded. Uh, this week's episode uh, is with the co founders of Tartil. Very interesting. Okay, so um, just to give you guys uh, an idea, we did shoot an episode, uh, Sam and I, uh, this week as well. Uh, we're going with this episode, the Tartil episode, as the episode that we're going live or that's going live on the YouTube. And therefore, the episode with me and Sam, if you guys still want to listen to it, is live or will be live on our on the Inner Circle. That's this week's Inner Circle episode, inshallah. So if you want to check that out, head over to freshlygrounded.com forward slash Inner Circle. Uh, get yourself some extra freshly grounded content because it's worth it. Every single week, an extra episode of Fresh Ground. That's four extra episodes of Fresh Ground a month. That's absolutely 12 times four extra episodes of Fresh Grounded per year. Do the math because I don't want to. Uh, this week's episode is with uh, Tartil. Now, you guys may or may not have remembered. Oh, why am I looking there? I should be looking here. Sorry, I'm, I can see myself here. You guys will have seen. Uh, that on my Instagram, I recently announced, this week I announced that I am uh, joining the Tertil team as their head of marketing and content, uh, which is a really, really exciting uh, new role for me. Uh, it doesn't change anything for Fresh Grounded. If you haven't seen that video where I explain everything, you can see that on my personal YouTube channel. Just search Faisal on, in, on YouTube and you can find that video and I explain all of it in there. Uh, but Tertil essentially is an amazing uh, mobile app that allows you to engage with the Quran in a way that you naturally would, which is with your voice. It's a voice-led app. And right now, it's the probably the most amazing app I've seen. Uh, and I'm trying to be as sincere and, non and unbiased as possible, but it really is uh, for advancing your memorization of the Quran. It's got features like being able to hide the ayat on a page. And then as you recite those ayat, um, they get filled up in the page where those ayat would be. So it's great for memorization. It's a great memorization technique. It has a uh, mistake detection with that revision or uh, with uh, those words. So for example, a common one, if you, for example, say, Ya'alamun, uh, but you, but the ayah is um and some other mistakes uh, words. There's one that came to mind that I did early on in my Quran journey that I can't quite remember, but it will, it will highlight that in red that you said the wrong word, for example. Uh, it also has the, it has a search capability, which is stunning, where you can basically uh, press the microphone and say an eye of the Quran and it will take you and find the eye of the Quran almost instantly, instantly, actually. Uh, and that's also great for, for, for example, you're in a class or you're listening to a lecture online and the, uh, Imam or the speaker mentions an ayah, you can kind of hold your uh, phone to it and Tartil will find the ayah instantly. So it's got some really, really cool features and you can actually download Tartil uh, by clicking the link in the bio or by just going to Tartil.ai, that's T-A-R-T-E-E-L dot A-I. But this episode is with three of the co-founders of Tartil and it's all about the story of Tartil, uh, what these guys have in store for the future, how they came together, why they came together, uh, what they're building and you'll find out... A, today that Tartil is not just a Quran app it's a lot more than that it's and the future for Tartil is very very exciting and I'm absolutely honored to be a part of the team uh, so enjoy this episode of Freshly Grounded with Tartil and welcome to Freshly Grounded the brand new podcast well, it's not exactly brand new anymore is it welcome to Freshly Grounded the podcast that's better Created by best friends Faisal and Sam. Huh? I welcome. I said welcome to freshly grounded. After that bit. Created by. And after that bit. Best friends Faisal and Sam. Really? Okay. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, everyone listening, and mainly assalamu alaikum to the the three I have with me. Alhamdulillah. Let me just check my audio levels that they're good. They are fine. Um, right, this is probably only the uh, second podcast I've done with three people on the podcast, I think, and um, it's a bit of a challenge, however, I feel like with you guys it's not going to be, because I've been in a few meetings with you all for about a week now, and I've noticed that you're all very good at letting each other speak, uh, which is something I've probably got to get better at, so... I don't think this will be as much of a challenge, uh, hopefully. But I think it'd be nice to perhaps get like a, a brief introduction from everybody. Uh, just kind of like, I suppose, your name and then your role within Tartil. And then we can kind of get on with the uh, 
with my line of questioning, uh, which was nice. It feels nice to not be in the hot seat uh, for the first time with you guys. So uh, let's start with Anas. Hi, sorry, uh, Anas about Devon. Uh, I currently in Boston, Massachusetts, on the east coast of US. Uh, and most of my work is basically related to the ML, the back end, and a lot of the engineering going on behind the scenes at Tarsi. Amazing. And Akil? So I'm Akil. I uh, help with the operation and the product side of things, uh, strategy, anything related with the, the user interactions, etc. Awesome. All right, I guess uh, leaves me for last. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, my name is Mohammed Musa, uh, usually based out of Canada. And uh, I lead uh, you know, most of the mobile work at Tartil and uh, some of the other engineering work that we do. Alhamdulillah. Awesome. Well, uh, welcome to all of you for uh, uh, to Freshly Grounded. It's lovely to have you all here. And uh, I should uh, I should say it's an interesting week because obviously uh, we just announced this past week that I've joined the team at Tertil from a marketing perspective. And uh, so we, I, I, I threw out a post on Instagram and I said, who would like to kind of hear more about Tertil, more from kind of the back end, the backstory, and um, I suppose who's behind it and what the app really is and means and what the company is and means and the future of the company as well so everybody was really really excited to get into that and to understand Tertin on a, on a better level so I'm really excited as well because uh, there's still so much that I want to know and learn about and I think that's in itself going to take months but let's get started with uh, the beginning because there's three of you here right now with me and and, and you guys are the three co-founders but I know at the beginning um there was four, right? So I don't know who wants to start with that, but it would be amazing to kind of hear about that uh, and, and, and that origin story. I want to kind of leave it kind of general and blank so that we can hear it from you guys, but I'm interested to knowing how Tartil started. Sure, I'm happy to kind of talk about this. So Alhamdulillah, Tartil as a company started about a year and a half ago. Um, we had kind of, uh, all of us had uh, previously met the, the four of us who, who ended up being kind of the co-founders of the company, um, had all previously met and been working in this space uh, on the side uh, before kind of making Tartid what it is today. And uh, we realized that there was a huge need in the Muslim community for uh, not just the technology that we were building, uh, but the kind of company that we wanted to build as well. So not to build a company or any kind of organization that's purely just focused on developing a product, but rather some kind of organization that can exist to uh, further develop the rest of the ecosystem. So to build a space for other Muslims to come and actually engage with you know, technology and STEM, to learn about how they can have a role in that and to kind of mature the thought and the discussion in this space uh, so that we can have uh, in the future, inshallah, a lot more than just Tartil being able to work in this space and, and benefit the Muslim community in the way that we're trying to do. Um, so alhamdulillah, we, we started out about a year and a half ago, uh, and uh, we've been working on the product, building out the product, building out the team, uh, building out uh, a lot of the space and doing a lot of understanding of what direction the technology needs to go to best meet the Muslim community. And uh, we were originally four co-founders, um, but uh, we recently had uh, one co-founder uh, depart the team uh, at the uh, end of Ramadan. Uh, Alhamdulillah, he, uh, yeah, he had a lot of contributions to Tartil, uh, but uh, he decided to move on to, uh, you know, what was next for him. And uh, it's always great to see, you know, people find what's best for them at whatever time in their career. Um, you know, everyone has a certain thing that they're looking for, and sometimes that thing changes over time. And so, uh, you know, finding good opportunities for people to just go and contribute to you know, the Muslim community or even the broader like human community at large uh, in whatever way they can uh, and doing that in whatever way is, is most ideal for them and for the community uh, is always the most ideal thing. So Alhamdulillah, we've got uh, three co-founders still continuing to work on Tartil and uh, we've also had the chance to start to expand our team. As you mentioned, Alhamdulillah, we just made a great marketing uh, uh, hire. <laughs> His name is Faisal, of course. We don't <laughs> and, know how great uh, it is yet. You know, we, we, well, hopefully he's pretty great. <laughs> we, we, we're, we're, uh, you know, we, we, we have a lot of confidence on our end, alhamdulillah. Exactly. And uh, we, we've also recently brought on, uh, you know, some other individuals to, uh, to contribute in key areas within Tartil. And uh, we're very excited to have them on board and, and very excited about the direction that we're going in. 
Amazing. So, uh, Akhil, I'll, I'll throw this to you. So, uh, let's delve a bit more into the so, um, into the story about how it started. Then, so uh, before we talk about kind of like the direction that it's going into now. So, um, there's four of you. You all. Um, I'm all right in thinking you're all kind of working in the tech space, but for different kind of big tech companies. Um, how did you guys come together? How did the idea of Tartil come together? And then, kind of, what were the steps there? So, just a bit more about, I suppose, the the origin story more so. Yeah, so to clarify a little bit, a little bit of what Mohammed was talking about, so like the organization of Tartil as a product company kind of came together a year and a half ago. Uh, but prior to that, it was like an open source community project uh, garnering the largest uh, chronic data set that exists out there at this point. So uh, there were a lot of uh, key individuals over the past few years that have kind of come into the organization from that open source community and contributed. So I think it would be a... Uh, uh, unjust to say that like the deal story is just the four co-founders that came together in the past few years, but uh, the amount of effort and contributions that have ha happened over the past three, four years of these individuals and the idea and how it came together is another story in its own right. And maybe we can get into that if you're interested. Um, but beyond that, uh, Muhammad, Anas and Abdul Latif were quite close to each other within the Bay Area. Uh, I don't think I've actually told this story to... Anas or Muhammad or even Abdul Latif in any capacity, but since we are on freshly grounded, maybe it's uh, useful for the the audience that you do have. So the way that I actually found Tortil was just searching the term Tortil on Google. And one of the main reasons was I was uh, going through a journey where I was uh, removing music from my life. And as a part of that journey, I was listening to a lot of Quran getting into all the different maqamats, the qirat, and the, the terminology around recitation of the Quran. And one of those terminologies were, was tartil. And as soon as I typed that in, the first thing that popped up was the project of garnering this audio data set. So I think it kind of shows like if you have the right intentions and you're going in one direction, Allah just kind of, kind of guides you into where you're kind of meant to be. So uh, it's quite amazing that from wanting to quit music to becoming a co-founder at, uh, at, at the organization is uh, quite unique and uh, I think an interesting space for people to kind of like really dive into when they do ask us like, how do I get involved? What I should be doing to uh, really move the needle forward for myself and the community as a whole. Amazing. And um, uh, okay, so Anas, I'm gonna pass it to you to try and continue the story because we've got some amazing information but I'm still interested in kind of the narrative as to the as to four guys come together. Uh, the, okay, so, so open, now we know kind of like the origins of Tertil in, in, in terms of what it was. Um, but I don't understand still the bridge. Where How did it go from what it was, which was this open source community, to then obviously you four coming together and saying, okay, let's make something serious here where we can really benefit the Muslim woman. And, 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 and at what point did that become something where the focus was on the on the memorization of the quran or or at least on like specifically the technology that because because i suppose you guys are developers or or, or uh, i know i keep saying we're like tech guys at heart right and so where was that where, did you know straight away that if you wanted to create something it had to be revolved around technology and, and hopefully revolutionizing the way that muslims interact with the quran uh, or, or with like i suppose like how they for example recite or memorize yeah, so one thing to keep in mind is, and we were all in the Bay Area at one point, we were all working at these tech companies. So uh, I was at Facebook, I was at Amazon, I built it was at Twitter, and then we also had friends, you know, Google, Airbnb, all these other places. So everyone was like, you know, tech oriented. And one of the interesting quirks of uh, the Bay Area is there's a lot of like hacker houses. Um, and usually they revolve around certain themes or elements and like co-founders get together. Um, so it was like Muslim hacker houses in, in SF. Uh, that was where like Abdul Latif was at. And there's one that was in like South Bay in near Mountain View. That's where I was staying, uh, for example. And uh, the people there that were staying in these houses, you know, they would get involved in like different like projects or themes and whatnot. And you know, one of the things that came out was like a Muslim hackathon, basically. So where you you do this like you know weekend long hackathon, 48 hours. You get together with like a few other people, and then you know you work on building like unique projects or like shipping something really quick and hacky. Um, you know, it was around that time, like, you know, we got to know each other, we got to meet, you know, other people who were interested in the space. And there was a lot of ideas floating around. And the idea of like the Tercio dataset collection project came out of one of those Muslim hackathons. And that's how we kind of got to meet each other. Uh, in fact, 
Ahmed and I, we were like gym buddies at, uh, you know, for like after a friendship. So like usually we'd go in, we go to like rock climbing or go to the gym and then, you know, we kind of like brainstorm ideas and stuff. And, you know, um, it was, it was a pretty interesting dynamic going on. Ahmed back then was working on like his own thing called Iqra. And then, you know, I was, I was just doing my own thing. I was helping out with Tarsil here and there. Um, but you know, just being in the same place, having the dynamic of, you know, all these Muslims getting together and working on different projects help basically cultivate um, that sort of, you know, interaction and basically pushed us towards, you know, what Tarsil is now. So I want to actually, go ahead. uh, I was going to say, I, I want to talk about raising our hands or anything. Or? There's no raising hands. No, it's just shout over each other. Whoever's the loudest wins. All right. I'm usually the loudest, so uh, <laughs> I'll step in here. Um, yeah, I, uh, I think that there's there's still one thing missing in, in, in what you were asking about, which is how that bridging piece came about. And I think it's really important for people to understand this piece because um, it's actually something we get a lot of questions around and it guides a lot of decisions we make is ultimately what led to that bridging, uh, which is that at one point, you know, all of us were working on this space, working on, you know, trying to build up this data set, trying to build up some product around this and kind of working on what would then turn into Tartid. And we were kind of working on it on the side, like all of us were working on our nine to five job or whatever at this tech company or that tech company or, or whatever. And, uh, and we would work on Tartid on the side. Everything was free and very kind of loosely set up and, and that kind of thing. And, um, you know, we were all trying to do our best and we were all trying to put in effort. But uh, I think when we, when anybody really took a, a step back and looked at it, yeah, we were making progress, but that progress was, was not enough. Um, that progress was really slow. And we, we all saw the potential. We, we saw what was actually like, we, we saw the need in the Muslim community. We saw all the people constantly telling us like, Hey, like, you know, how is, how's the progress going? Like, when can I use this? Like, when can this detect my mistakes? When can this, you know, do all these things? And um, the the need was very clearly there. And the progress, like, despite all of our best intentions and our best efforts, like, it it wasn't getting there fast enough. And um, the other problem is when you work on areas like what we're doing with Tartid, which is like, very sophisticated technology needs a lot of data, a lot of labeled data. Uh, you're using all kinds of like very uh, advanced GPUs to do training, to run inference in production. All of this kind of stuff that we're talking about, the underlying piece that should be behind this is dollar bills. You know, uh, it's expensive. It's not. It's not something that's the top of five dollar server on on whatever your favorite service is, and and you get going. And um, so we really needed time and we needed money in order to actually be able to execute on this and, and serve the Muslim community in the way that the community deserves. And so that was really the thing that made us start thinking, hey, maybe this needs to be a company. Maybe, you know, all of us wanted to make sure that our intentions were pure, that we were doing things, you know, for the sake of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala and not just doing it for the sake of, you know, making money or anything like this. Alhamdulillah, we all had good jobs and we're making the money already. And the, the main concern was how do we do this in a way that, will actually benefit the community and, and will allow people to benefit from from what we're trying to do and actually allow us to achieve what we have the intention uh, of doing, uh, you know, for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And so we realized, like, this is not going to go anywhere and people are never going to benefit from this unless there's a dedicated team of skilled individuals who have the resources backing them so that they can actually execute on this properly. And That was really the core realization that made us come across that bridge and make what, you know, what we have today as Tartil. And I think a lot of people come and approach us sometimes and they have questions around this process from a number of places. How did you get started? What was it like quitting your job? Why do you charge for Tartil, you know, for the premium subscription? And like all all kinds of questions come about here. Some of the most common questions we get are all around that core decision, which is what made us start. But at the end of the day, sometimes when people aren't sure, for example, why we have to charge for a premium subscription, if we didn't do this, if we didn't quit our jobs, if we didn't start working on this full time, uh, what Tartil is today and what it's going to be, inshallah, in the next year, in the next two years, in the next five years, I can't even begin to describe like how excited I am for that stuff, inshallah, like let alone where we're at right now. But even where we're at right now would not be here if we hadn't made that decision and we hadn't come to that realization about a year and a half ago. Amazing. So let, let's talk about where we are now. So uh, uh, my favorite thing uh, with 
uh, anything that I push out is trying to understand, like in in the simplest terms, the effects that it has on 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 people and like the number of people that are being um, affected by it. And so, in doing that kind of like digging and seeing that over five hundred thousand people have used Turtle or downloaded Turtle, that's a huge number. And um, so so let's and 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 an impact that first of all to to know that something in it's in such early stages is having such a big impact. I think is testament is testament to your guys's hard work. Uh, as well as the 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 technology and the technology being unique, obviously after like blessings from Allah and the fact that Allah is the one who is in control of all things, and if it wasn't for Him, kind of um, uh, uh, allowing that to happen, it wouldn't happen. Tertil today, Tertil now. How would you guys explain what Tertil is? Um, and then we can start talking about kind of like the future. Uh, the plans and stuff like that, but uh, what is Tertil now? If somebody, if I, if I, had to, if I had to say, you know, elevator pitch or you know, what is Tertil in one sentence? What would you guys say? So I think well, instead of describing Tertil, I think it's probably better to kind of like highlight what our core mission as an organization is. Cool. So when we did set up the organization, we set it up as a benefit corporation, which means that we have a mandate to serve the needs of Muslims when it comes to the Quran. And that's kind of like our guiding light. And one of the things that kind of drives us is using technology and using the opportunities that we have, the resources, the connections. We're, we realize that we're in a really privileged uh, circumstance to be working on this, some of this stuff and to be in contact and be able to leverage the resources and the mentors and the, the contacts that we have in the ecosystem to kind of like reignite this Islamic golden age again. So like. We're at a very early age. If you kind of look back over after a decade or et cetera, we hope to be like that that spark or that lighting of the fire on a candle that kind of like influenced and encouraged people to look at what they can do from a technology perspective for the Islamic ecosystem as a whole. And as an organization, as a mission, as a vision, that's like our guiding light. So when when we say we're not a Quran app, we really mean it. Like when I look in you in your eyes and say like, we're drastically engaging with the technology and looking at first principles and seeing what the Quran and what the Islamic corpus can be, how that can be unlocked with the, the stuff that's on the, on the uh, basically on the come up as far as technology is related uh, is, is just mind blowing. And a lot of people don't have context to the advances that are happening in technology, how society is changing and so forth. And Tertil is just that like little blip in that journey of making sure that we move in the right direction and we are encouraging people to come into that ecosystem. As a business, um, we do provide services and solutions that kind of come on top of that and allow you to engage with the Quran in a way that is not only natural, but also very engaging and unique in some way that you have never kind of experienced in the, in the past. So. We have unique use cases around like memorization, ability to locate the ayah whenever you want, et cetera, which we can get into a little bit deeper when we get into the app part of it. But as a whole, as an organization, as a, as a company, as a group of individuals, um, as a community, we're much, much larger than what's there. And uh, it, like the excitement of how much we forethought about like where this ecosystem is going is, is boundless. and. Uh, we're really excited to kind of like start advocating and uh, uh, what would you call it evangelizing this vision to the rest of the community and I hope like you're a big part of that and you're able to kind of like curate the community and the right individuals with the right aligned incentives and uh, the mind frame to kind of come in and help support because there's no way we can do that alone. Yeah, I think that one of the things that really excited me about Tertil was the vision that you guys uh, have and had for uh, the future. And I know I haven't even heard much of the vision for the future, but the fact that there is a vision for the future beyond the uh, kind of flagship product that exists now is exciting for me because uh, as I kind of mentioned in the video that I made, um, I think moving the needle is very important to me. I want to be able to leave this world feeling like um, there's something I've left behind, not because, not through Faisal, not because of my name or because of what, who I am. That's not relevant at all. But 
um, I was able to push something or move something in some aspect where Muslims are benefiting for, 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 for time to come. And, and I think that's what's exciting because the truth is that um, things uh, die out, right? Like I, I often speak about that with, with, with Fresh Lugani. I say that I want Fresh Lugani to be something that um, podcasting could just be a trend. And it, it kind of is a trend. And I, that's why I'm very eager to say that po- Fresh Lugani is not just a podcast, just like how, for example, Tertil is not just an app, right? Uh, because if re- if podcasting died tomorrow, my hope is that Fresh Lugani wouldn't. We would find a new uh, avenue to uh, do what it is that we do to push the message that we want to push and to encourage Muslims to try and uh, be the, become their true authentic self, right? And try and... Uh, uh, succeed in, in from both like a dunya and an akhira perspective, and so uh, that was something that excited me about Tertil. And it's interesting you speak about kind of technology. I want to I, I want to delve into that. And now f- sounds like a good time, so I'll throw this to you, Anas. Uh, when uh, I was speaking to my wife, and she was like, "Oh, how's things going?" Like really early days, obviously one or two days in, and I said, "I think that um, one of the big challenges for me is going to be." This app, this the here we we have an app, and the the beauty and 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 the uniqueness of the app is because of the technology behind it, right? And uh, or part of the part of the beauty of the app, at least a big part. And uh, what comes with that is that here's a bunch of like tech guys who have come along and created the, the the most amazing technology that allows this app to exist. And I think my challenge is going to be fighting these guys uh to 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 be able to like r- um keep that uniqueness because of uh, because of like the foundations of tertiel and com- and be able to 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 present it to an audience in a way that's not necessarily simplified but um but remove all of the jargon right and i think that's going to be my uh, core uh role as well as like the thing that i'm most excited about but also perhaps the biggest challenge and um so my for context my wife is a uh software tester nobody actually knows this um but um oh she was a software tester like since we've moved out here um she's currently not working anymore and so she understands that world, right? And I was like, you know, we're in a meeting and like the developers, I think the first meeting we had Anas was with developers, right? It was, um, I can't remember the first meeting uh, we had had. What, what, what was it? It was, uh, is it the weekly th- sync? I think yeah, it was maybe. I think it was the one that, yeah, the one that Mohammed couldn't make it for. And I was listening to kind of people like telling their stuff and I was listening to the words and I was like, all right, cool. We've got something on our hands here where like I'm clearly the odd one out and I'm excited about it. So, um, yeah, the technology about Intertil is very exciting. What kind of challenges did we have early on um, and, and specifically technical challenges when building the app? Yeah, there's there's a lot of challenges and, you know, the technology just in terms of like the underlying, you know, theory and infrastructure was already out there was basically taking it and applying it towards Islamic context. So, you know, speech recognition, search, NLP, all this stuff, Facebook, Baidu, all these big tech companies are kind of like pushing their own technology out there. And it's very, you know, uh, fine tuned, basically, for the English language, for the for Mandarin, for Chinese. And so taking a lot of the work out there like you see a lot of companies like you know ai companies that succeed because a lot of the models and a lot of the technology and infrastructure out there is already catered towards you know serving the english language or serving you know the western population or serving you know the chinese eastern population um but there's not a lot of work being done for for muslims and for us as as a muslim community from a technical perspective we're basically in like the bronze age where we're not even in you know we're not even in, in, in the digital age. We're not even, we're, we're way behind basically. And so in the past, you know, Alhamdulillah, we've had the ability, you know, as Muslims, we had like, you know, Beit al hikmah we had these houses of wisdom, we had universities, we had the ability to uh, bridge basically Islam and religion and, you know, apply it to like our life sciences and not only influence ourselves, we influence, you know, the Greeks, the Romans. And that's why like, even you see like a lot of the well-known like Muslim scholars, they had like Roman names, for example, like Ibn Sina was like Ibn Sina. And then even back then, like, for example, the things that they would design, like, for example, uh, Al-Jazari, who's the father of robotics, and the, some of the things that he designed, uh, they were like, you know, water instruments or automations or robots, but they would help you wash better. They would help you do wudu. They'd help you, you know, basically in your spiritual and Islamic lifestyle. And so 
back then we had you know a bunch of this technology that people were were working on and they're applying it towards islam now we're trying to do the same thing it's like we're we're almost starting from from zero from scratch you had to build a lot of the underlying infrastructure and a lot of the underlying technology to be able to serve the modern needs of muslims you know in 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 the current age and so for example now we have like right, right now for example a lot of scholars that you know they're inherently specialized they're doing very well on their own but when it comes for them to actually interact and engage with the modern like muslim community and you know with the technology currently like they're they don't have the tools they don't have the resources and muslims themselves too you know it's very difficult for them to find like you know right now you have quran apps you have hundreds of quran apps but they they all just provide you like a static interface so what we're trying to do is we're trying to change you know the modern understanding of like how we actually engage with the quran in a more natural and a more you know uh you know uh, in a better way and in basically the way that improves your own relationship with the quran all this to say that you know uh we we had to start a lot of the uh thinking basically like i said from first principles we had to start you know from from zero i had to rethink the way you know the quran and you know the way like the islamic corpus and the narrative comes up in in the digital age and that starts from you know the way we collect and annotate for example our audio data set the way we render and display the quran you know which muhammad could speak more about the way we digitize basically um quranic assets it's all it all had to be done in a unique way such that we could deliver a novel and a valuable experience for muslims to do so uh, i'll pause there in case you have any questions since i feel like you i might have lost you over there no, it, 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 it put me in a deep train of thought because, uh, you know, you remind me of the fact that often as Muslims, we talk about the fact that, you know, our algebra comes from Muslims or coffee, like it has, we have such a big like uh, stake in the, the origins of coffee. And you hear so many other examples and you're often, or I'm often led to think, yeah, but um, but what now almost? Like it's great that we were... That we that Islamic history um, has a strong hold, like a strong hold on uh, the origins of some of the most impactful uh, practices today, like for example uh, maths and stuff like that, right? Uh, but you, uh, it's led me to start thinking, like you know, nowadays in 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 this world, what will people a hundred years in the future say about uh, us? How we talk about the people who perhaps. You know, when we speak about like coffee or uh, mat, I'm sure there's better examples as well. There's just the two things that I can think of right now. Uh, so that's what it led me to think about. It led me to think about, you know what, you're right. Like there's great uh, minds in tech right now. And the obvious ones that people are speaking about all the time nowadays are obviously down the more on the realm of like the Elon Musk's or the guys who are like doing like crazy stuff in crypto. But um, yeah, what about the Muslims? So that's what it led me to think about. And it actually is, it, it makes it really exciting. So there are yeah, a lot of Muslims in the Middle East. Yeah, so yeah. all three of us speak. At <laughs> but there are a lot of Muslims in these tech ecosystems that are leading the way. And uh, we've been engaging with uh, quite a few of them, et cetera. So it's like, how do we get or create more opportunities where these individuals can come in and create a shift towards focusing on some of this technology as well? And then the other challenge is, is like business models around Islamic technology have been kind of like shunned for the past few decades or whatever it may be. And how do you kind of like re-engage individuals and create value for people? So even when you were talking about like historical context, when people think about the Quran, they think about it as like a physical book. And then it's like divided in 30 parts is how everything is set up. It's not, it's like mostly modern um, innovations as far as like how the Quran is presented and what type of fonts are used, et cetera. Like even when you talk about the Medina Musaf, I guess the majority of individuals wouldn't know like how many versions exist, what type of fonts exist and why those lines, et cetera. And they expect like when they think about a Quran app, they think from a very linear lens of like the Quran is a book. This is how it was presented to me. And this is how I was taught the Quran when I was younger. And this is what I expect from how I should be engaging in the Quran. Whereas like there's a whole new world for you out there to actually leverage some of the technologies, leverage tools, leverage things like space repetition to actually memorize the Quran or engage with it. Um, there's things like um, contextual search or semantic search to actually engage with the corpus of the Quran in a more meaningful manner. All these technologies, all these areas where you have AI, you have, uh, or even in the sense you just talked about crypto, like what is the impact of having a censorship resistant 
chronic most of that the the Uyghur can now access because there there's no way it can be censored. It's peer to peer, it's accessible, it's permissionless, etc. Like we're actually thinking about these deep issues and thinking wow. about how we can bring this technology forward. And wow. it, the 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 fact of the matter is, all these ideas exist, and I believe like. Uh, I don't want to get too deep into like a rabbit hole here, but like I do believe that the world functions on some sort of like shared consciousness. So these ideas exist in the in the abyss or whatever you want to call it, but who's actually grabbing them and executing on them? And we want to be the individuals that kind of like help foster that culture, help foster that community to to be able to do that. And uh, that's basically like our vision and our mission is like how far can we take it, and then how can we influence and be that stepping stool for more individuals to come in, use our tools, use our resources that we've invested our time and efforts into to take it to the next step. So we might not be successful in being this huge or profitable organization, but I'm sure that will be individuals that kind of like uh, create resources that people benefit from. Even if it's one individual, it's two individuals. We'll, we'll hopefully, with the, the will of Allah, be able to create that impact, inshallah. I think uh, Akil really touched on something very critical right there, right in the end, uh, about the fact that these ideas are already out there, and the issue is about you know going out and grabbing them and, and working on them. I cannot tell you how many times I've had someone come up to me or like leave the review on the app and like all this kind of stuff. I've heard this like dozens, maybe more than a hundred times now of like, oh. I had this idea like to build like, you know, what you yeah, guys are building yeah. in Tartid. Like everyone's always like, I had this idea two years ago. I had this idea five years ago. I had this, I mean, I had this idea personally, like what, seven, eight years ago or something like this. And that's what led me to start working on this whole area. Sure. Right. We are where we are only now. Um, and like, it, it's been a long journey and a lot of amazing work has been done by a lot of, you know, very talented individuals in, or, in, in order for us to even get to where we are now. I think that really underlies it is that what we're doing is not like um, some kind of really novel or really like hard to come up with idea. Like we're not area experts in Islam who had like some deep insight after doing PhD and like stuff like this and coming up with, with something, right? It, it's not like this is a, a new area or a new type of technology necessarily in and of its own right. It's really the fact that it does require some specialization, some level of skill set, some level of resources to actually execute on it. And it requires those, like some individual somewhere to actually come align with that talent, align with that set of resources and be able to execute. And that's really the issue, like uh, having lived in the Bay Area, one of the most unique things uh, for, for anyone who doesn't know Bay Area, also you know, known as Silicon Valley, like one of the most unique things from that place is that there has been a history of companies being built there. And what people do when they leave those companies, oftentimes they go and start other companies. Yeah. Many great companies that we think about today and we use the products from today, the founders of those companies were early employees or founders of other companies that we know of from five years before, 10 years before, etc. And this is a very common pattern. And now you have f world famous incubators like Y Combinator. You have all kinds of venture capital firms. You have all kinds of other resources that are all there. You have all kinds of talent. I mean, uh, you know, coming from Canada, we have this issue in Canada. We call it brain drain. Any, you know, most really, really good engineers, software engineers particularly, what they do when they graduate from university, if they can, is they move south of the border and they move to the United States and they move specifically to cities like California, New York, Seattle. And, uh, and like, think about why do they do that? Like, that's where the resources are. That's where the money is. I mean, that's also where better weather is. I won't, I won't, uh, you know, get into that too much. It makes me sad every time I think about even the weather but uh you know aside from that the money is there the resources there the talent is there like you know you go and you get someone like ennis like all of a sudden now like i go to the mosque i see ennis i go to the gym i hang out with ennis and then we can start talking about ideas we can work on things together we end up making you know something called tartine so having that ecosystem it's not really one piece or two pieces it's an entire ecosystem where people are actually building these kind of companies, innovating, but it's not just that they're doing this, they also have the resource around them to do that. And I, I think that that's one of the biggest gaps 
that anybody who wants to work in this space of serving the Muslim community, leveraging technology in a new way, that's the gap that everyone is trying to overcome. And that's something that we still struggle with with Tartid. Like, it's not like we all of a sudden have overcome this and we're past that hurdle. No, we very much are still tackling that hurdle. But one of the things that we hope is that if we are actually successful, we can leverage the p position that we're at past that hurdle to pull people along with us and get more people over that hurdle. The more people who end up past that bump, you know, ideally we can then build that ecosystem ourselves. We can have funding for projects like this. We can have talent for projects like this. There are so many really, really talented uh, Muslims working in all of these top tech companies doing incredible work at those places. But finding them a way that they can actually get into you know, building something like Tartid or, or anything else that you can think of for the Muslim community, that's that's the challenge. That's the bump that they have to get over. And uh, overall, there needs to be an ecosystem that can make that transition easier. And that's going to pay off huge dividends for the entire community for a long time, inshallah. Inshallah. One of the aspects of Islam is to serve, but the, own, the, the Islam is built upon us as slaves of Allah serving Allah. And one of the aspects that 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 leads to that in in some ways is serving the people, and um, you know we speak about this in the marketing world where essentially it, uh, the job of a of a person in marketing is to serve the audience, to figure out what the audience want and serve it to them in the best way that so that you can benefit them, right? And that's why like there's like this huge push now against the kind of um what people call marketing which like the 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 i think like the true market is hate which is the the pop-ups and the throwing things at people's faces and hey like you buy this now because true marketing is serving the people uh, and serving your audience and likewise uh, islam is about serving and we know various different narrations where, for example, it's um, like serving your guests, for example, helping your brother in his time of need and so on and so forth. And ultimately that leading to serving Allah. And um, the, 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 the beautiful thing about technology in this day and age is it allows us to understand the people who are interacting with our technology uh, on a deeper level. Um, so, Mohammed, going back to you now, uh, in understanding that, in Tartil being a service where really we are trying to serve the Muslim Ummah, um, what have we been able to learn already about, for example, user behavior, um, especially considering in the Muslim world, I would imagine not a huge amount of data exists, or at least in comparison to, for example, the non-Muslim world. Yeah, we recently even put out a, a blog post about some learnings that we noticed in Ramadan um, it's been very interesting exploring how people understand the Quran, engage with the Quran and use it so far. Um, we've seen a lot of learnings around uh, how people actually leverage gamified features, for example, like streaks to actually continue their behavior and keep them motivated and keep a regular pattern with the Quran. We've seen that really pay off, for example, in Ramadan. Uh, a number of individuals, and actually I, I'm you know, happy to say it, like myself included, uh, have completed a khatm of the Quran during Ramadan for the first time while using Tartid. And it really is like, like I, you know, for myself, I can very easily say it is thanks to Tartid as a, a product, uh, allowing people to achieve that because um, there, there's something about, you know, seeing your progress actually get tracked and having that reminder and having that check-in and, you know, being able to go through day by day and, and have it follow up with you that keeps you on track. And we still have a lot of things we're trying to learn and, and you know iterate on within the product around how we help people do this. But that's just one very simple example where people have been able to take Tartil and, and achieve something that they weren't able to achieve before uh, thanks to some of the features we built. But even outside of people using the Tartil app the way that we had originally intended, there's a lot of very interesting things that we've seen. So for example, uh, we've seen a number of organizations leverage the searching functionality of Tartin in order to help them achieve their mission uh, to whatever their audience is doing. So one really good example of this, uh, there's an organization called uh, Mohsin that uh, serves basically deaf individuals. And what they do is they uh, closed caption uh, Islamic videos. So you'll take this video of this, spe this speaker speaking and, you know, he's reciting Quran at some point and, and mentioning 
this area or, or, or this sura or whatnot in order to, uh, you know, convey a point. And uh, what they need to do is they need to be able to find that area, get the text of that area quickly and, and add it to the caption in order to produce these caption videos for these individuals. And so what they did is they took the, you know, Tartil search and they actually used Tartil search to very quickly identify the area, get the text from the area and include it in the closed captioning. So it speeds up their process of serving the deaf community and actually having access to Islamic, sorry, Islamic videos. Um, another really cool example you've seen there's another app called uh, Korea. Basically, what they wanted to do is uh, uh, they wanted to build a space where sisters could go and be able to listen to other Muslim women from around the world recite the Quran. Because most of the Quran recordings that are available and that you'll find in Quran apps today, they're all uh, you know famous uh, male Muslim reciters. So they wanted to build this space for sisters to be able to listen to other sisters reciting uh, and 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 see how that is is being done. And they collected a team of volunteers to actually be able to collect these audio clips from around the world, figure out what's being recited there and, and you know, add all the labeling so that I can then go in the app and listen to these recordings. But in order for them to be able to figure out what is being recited with a team of volunteers, most of whom are not father or anything like this, like they don't know what's being recited, that becomes a huge barrier to their work. And so they actually discovered Tartil and they've been using Tartil so again, search the area, find out what's being recited very quickly, and then being able to add all the metadata so that they can then deliver that in the app experience. So we've seen, for example, those two cases where people have leveraged the Tartil search in order to actually serve, you know, maybe an overlapping community to what we're, you know, who's using Tartil already, but maybe an entirely different community altogether in terms of, uh, you know, benefiting from this technology. Even another case we've seen more recently is, uh, similar to you know what what Mohsen is doing uh we saw a very interesting case this past ramadan where um uh there's a brother who basically discovered that uh, he can use tartil in order to follow along with tarwi even though he's deaf and uh we've seen this kind of use case come up a lot where people want to follow along with tarwi who are not hafaz whatever amount of the quran they memorize they still want to be in tarwi every night following along with the imam and figuring out what the imam is reciting and keeping up with the imam for many people has been very difficult, uh, especially in countries where, you know, Muslims are, are Muslims are there, but uh, Arabic is not the the majority spoken language. It's it's I think uh, almost ninety percent of Muslims around the world do not actually speak Arabic as their primary language, and so you might think like this is only a small group, but no, th that's actually a a huge group of Muslims are are needing this. Uh, this kind of technology uh, in Tarwi and, and in other contexts to be able to actually engage with the Quran better in the meantime while they make other efforts like like trying to learn Arabic. And so we've seen organizations like uh, the East Plano Islamic Center in, in Texas, which is uh, one of the largest uh, masajid in all of the United States. Um, they actually put Tartil as part of their live stream. So they set up uh, you know, a video of the imam as he's reciting on one side of the screen and on the other side of the screen, they've got the Tartil screen following along with the translations being shown live. So if you're just trying to follow along with what the Imam is reciting, whether it's on the screens in the masjid or whether it's following their YouTube live stream at home or, or so on and so forth, um, you can not only see what the Imam is reciting in the Quran word by word as he's reciting it, but then you can also see the translation alongside with it so that you can actually engage better with Tarweeh and, and really understand you know, the words of Allah and, and, and what's being recited. So I think this is still the beginning. We are seeing on a regular basis now more and more of these cases where people are taking Tartil, having their own problems that they need to tackle and finding a way where they can leverage even the limited technology that we've built so far to already serve uh, a much larger group of people and a much larger set of needs. And uh, so I, think one, I have to say, like, one as a... One case that I think you kind of mentioned, forgot to mention, was the memorization or revision part and how that has been like uh, imagining and re-innovating how people actually engage with their memorization workflows and how they design um, their processes around memorization and what impact that has. Maybe you want to touch a little bit on that as well. Yeah, I think uh, you know that that's a a very good point. We've also seen a lot of people figure out their own memorization workflows that we didn't even imagine when we built our team. So 
we've seen a, a brother from the UK, uh, his name was Qasim, and he had a workflow where he would switch back and forth between what we call the Mus'haf mode and the adaptive mode uh, in the app in order to see the page and recite on the page and have his mistakes highlighted and read on the page. And that would help him commit it to memory. But then he would also then immediately switch to the adaptive mode where he could then see the translation as well. So simultaneously, what he was doing is he would, you know, memorize the Arabic text. He would get a mental mapping, not only of the page, but also like the mistakes that he's making. He would start to memorize where they are because they're highlighted in red on the page. And then he would also at the same time be memorizing the translation so that he could then better commit it to memory that he, he actually understands what's being recited and it helps him make fewer mistakes as well. Um, so switching back and forth between those modes, at one point I almost removed that whole uh, quick toggle feature. I'm glad I did it, alhamdulillah. Like yeah, after we had that call with him, I was like, <laughs> you know, <few>. you know what? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I almost removed that without that understanding. But, you know, he, he came up with that, uh, w with that, you know, really great workflow and it's been working very well for him. We've got another brother that we saw where, um, he figured out how to basically use the peaking functionality. So we've got a memorization mm -hmm. mode where you can basically hide the words on the page. And as you recite, they get revealed. Um, so people used to, you know, cover part of the page with a hand or a pencil and whatnot, and that doesn't really work out too well. Um, so we can do that automatically, but we've also got this cool feature now where you can peek the next word, peek the next few words, peek the next A and so on and so forth. So he came up with this whole workflow where he recites really quickly. And every time he's about to get stuck, he peeks. So he keeps going smoothly, but as a result of like that peaking functionality, he can keep going over the same page or the same set of ayahs many times very quickly. And he ends up peaking fewer and fewer times, you know, each iteration until he ends up committing it, uh, the whole thing to memory without needing to peak at all. Um, so we're still starting to dig into, you know, some of these different workflows that people have come up with, but it's also very cool to see, you know, you build some features as a developer, you're like, hey, this is going to work this way, it's going to work that way. Maybe you don't even realize, like, people are going to come with their own expectations, with their own thinking about how to leverage this then, and they come up with their own uh, workflows. And what I was going to say earlier is, um, as a developer or as someone working on this product, basically, it's very cool to see people come up with all these things that you never thought of before. Um, that, that, that's honestly one of the most exciting things about like working on this kind of technology is seeing the impact that it has on people and how people then go and take your ideas or your product or whatever, and then go and build on it to achieve even, even greater things. Yeah. You know, one of the, mo uh, one of the apparently most prominent ways of memorizing the Quran I had heard from a brother who, um, was memorizing. Uh, so he went away to Egypt, came back, and he was. I was kind of asking him for some tips and stuff, and he said that one of the uh, the popular ways tends to be you have the mushaf, I suppose, in your hand, and you go and sit as close as possible to a, a, a blank white wall. And as you're looking at the mushaf, you're then looking at that wall. And the, the, the point in doing that is, A, there's no distractions, and B, you can kind of picture because there's no distractions it's just a blank white wall you can kind of picture the page right and because the, really the ultimate goal is to try and have if everybody had a photographic memory of the pages then everything would be great right and what's beautiful about Tertil is it's a it's, it's a modern version of that really popular technique some could argue like one of the like most um renowned techniques and it's a modern version of it because uh, Tertil uh, allows you to, with that, with the, the fact that it hides the ayat, essentially get that white wall on your phone. Uh, however, as you recite, when they when those ayat fill out, they're filling out on on the actual page on, on the Quran. So you're able to actually get a photographic me memory of the page and get that idea without having to have the mushaf, so that you don't forget what the page looks like. But then also looking at a white page. Uh, another thing I wanted to kind of quickly mention: I have to go uh, for Maghrib now, but. Um, you mentioned about, and I don't want to forget this point, so I'm saying it publicly as a, a, a uh, accountability for myself, but when you were speaking about the uh, deaf Muslims, there's this amazing organization who uh, I believe, subhanAllah, they need so much more support because uh, it, during COVID, these guys were about to shut down. And um, uh, I tried to get the message out about them because I, it would have been horrible for me just as a just as a Muslim, to see an organization that like they shut down, they're called Al Ishara, and they um, they are in the UK, probably the biggest 
for me, the only organization I know that supports deaf Muslims. And they've, uh, I think they're, they're going to be probably the first organization in the world to, to, uh, to have a, or they've already done it, or they're working on a full Mus'haf in um, sign language, in British sign language. And they also, for mus- most of the Masjid and most of the TV channels in the UK, they're the guys who provide a sign language um, uh, expert who, who translates what the sermon and stuff like that. And uh, working with and supporting with cool organizations like that is always something that really excites me because here we have a product that could really benefit these like uh, huge data set of Muslims that they're already benefiting. And to, to have them have an even stronger relationship with the Quran is something that's very exciting. Um, I'm going to take a break for Maghrib, inshallah. We'll be back straight after that. And uh, we'll, car- we'll carry on uh, because this is a really, really cool dis- uh, discussion and I want to kind of delve in a bit more. Uh, and uh, there's, some, there's, there's, there's some key parts of uh i suppose like uh technology in the muslim world or specifically with apps that in in over the past couple years i think some muslims have become disheartened uh because of perhaps like uh uh certain news coming out and stuff like that and i don't think it would be fair uh if we didn't speak about that and 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 have that transparent conversation and see where you guys are with that or where i suppose we are at with that now as tertil so uh we'll discuss that inshallah uh, if you guys are okay with kind of taking a five minute break and uh, we'll jump back on you after that uh, same link. Is that is that good with everyone? Sounds good. Right. Okay, and we Sounds are back. Good. Alhamdulillah. Uh, okay, so Aqil, I'm gonna I'm gonna come to you with this. So data right now is a huge conversation generally uh, among the mass, and then more so, I think m- as Muslims we took a bit of a hit because I think generally like we seem to have this thing anyway where it's like we want to be more conscious of like what what a lot of people's like in the outside world like people's intentions and stuff and then obviously like there was this big like data thing that happened a few years ago in like muslim there's like huge muslim app uh, that everybody obviously already knows about we spoke about it freshly grounded before we had when we had the pillars guys on as well uh who by the way doing an amazing job as well um it's nice actually because we've had like pillars on we had quran leon now we had tertil on so which is which is also a nice uh, uh it's a nice uh thought that the ummah hopefully is like you know all working towards a uh, a goal and not uh not taking like a toxic like approach to it which is inshallah may Allah protect the the ummah in general um okay where was i with this okay so data is a big conversation how does tertil balance understanding and respecting that with also trying to create the best product possible for muslims so just from a personal perspective context like the past six years plus i've been working within the web3 ecosystem and data privacy protection decentralization etc is core to one of my core missions in life and bringing that into tertil uh, when you look at most organizations within the web 2 ecosystem what are their business models is sell your data put ads be as intrusive as you can to your user base and one of the core values and the uh, the like the guiding lights that we have for Tortilla is we're not going to do any of that. And that's been the one, one of the bigger challenges. Considering the amount of data, maybe we have one of the largest audio data sets in the world, not only related to Quran, but as a whole. Um, for us to monetize that, for us to monetize the, the amount of users that are engaging with our application from an ad perspective is huge. But that's not where we're kind of building value. So how we approach business, how we approach life is not from a value extraction perspective, but how do you create value for the individual and your community around you? So value generation is like the core principle that we're operating with Tortil and how we frame the business opportunities and how we engage with data, with privacy issues around that. So we're privacy first. There's no data being shared with third parties. Uh, how we even engage with internally with data information, et cetera. Uh, you probably come across some of the issues around like us not providing access to employees for certain things and so forth is something that we take very seriously and something that we'll continue to take very seriously. Um, even organizations that have like good data privacy rules, uh, regulations around, there's always hacks, et cetera. And we're very mindful of that as like, how can we create an ecosystem that's not uh, in consequence becoming a, a negative uh, uh, to the to the ummah in any regard. So this is like a huge obligation and a, and a, what would you call it like a 
tasks that we're taking on to kind of have this amount of data and to be able to process it for the benefit of the OMA. So the way that we're framing it is basically anything that benefits you and helps us train the models, we'll use it, your data for that. Aside from that, uh, there's no access, there's no uh, identifiable information associated with anything that's happening in the application. And uh, it's one of the core value props for us moving forward is this ability to create user experiences on top of the Quran where we don't need to be intrusive. Like you have a direct value. So if you're individually revising or memorizing the Quran, there's no reason you're not gonna get value out of the deal today as it stands. Like the, the front end experience, the user experience obviously needs a lot of work and that's the focus that we'll have over the next few months. But the, the ability for us to capture this information and then leverage it in a manner that's actually palatable for these user experiences is where we kind of lay. And that's like the framing that we have around like, hey, we're not just a cron app because we're building experiences based on the the, the way you interact with the cron. And that's kind of been the unique uh, uh, way of us really thinking about it. Uh, okay, uh, Anas, can you just tell me, because you're, you're uh, too quiet for my liking right now, uh, I want I wanted to ask about and and I like just touched on it now the idea of Turti being like kind of not a Quran app. I want I wonder if you could touch uh, slightly more on that and then also on I suppose like what the future holds for Turti or what like uh, or however much of it you can reveal to us about the intentions for Turti as a company uh, moving forward. Yeah. Um, I want to actually, I was going to touch on like some of the ideas that we had, at least that I have personally in terms of like data ownership and privacy and stuff is like, um, web three right now is like, um, has a lot of negative sentiment to it, but a lot of the underlying technologies are actually pretty useful. And I used to be like, you know, against it initially, but then I started to realize like, okay, no, there's actually some potential value here. And a lot of people talk about like centralized versus decentralized, you know, there's use cases for both. I mean, for 90% of the people out there having like a centralized uh, repository or database for like your user's information uh, makes sense. And there's no reason you should like look into like decentralized solutions like Ethereum or blockchain or whatever. Um, but when you're also thinking about user privacy and, you know, uh, giving like data ownership to the individual, individual users, uh, there's a lot of unique use cases there. Um, and the one thing that came to mind on top, on top of my head is like um, something called IPFS, um, Interplanetary File System. Basically, instead of you storing the data, and which, to be honest, for us is actually a, um, it, it's it's more of a, a, a crutch because we have to pay to store the data. We have to like process it, which is like comes with its own can of worms in terms of like when when you process things at scale. And so. Uh, it would actually be better for us. It'll be cheaper if we use some sort of like distributed file system where um, instead of us storing all the data, we put it uh, out there basically, um, obviously encrypted and private and owned essentially by these individual users. But we know we have reference to the individual like files that we can later on use for like training, for sharing with users with individuals and whatnot. Uh, so there are solutions where the data that we have now could be owned you know, by the user and then they give us permission, let's say, Let's say these 100 users give us permission to train their data. We'll only use those, for example, to, to train. Um, and so there's there's unique solutions that we can use to enhance user privacy and make it even more um, robust. Uh, that being said, that kind of also touches on things in the future. Um, so right now, a lot of like communities are becoming more digital. A lot of spaces are uh, essentially more technical. And a lot of tools, um, especially used by Muslims, you know, like you mentioned, especially related to the Quran and uh, related to schools, masajid, uh, education, instructors, you know, there, there's, I don't know why, but people are still, they have to go to like libraries and, you know, look into like huge books for like Islamic tafsir and Islamic context. Like a few years ago, we were actually contacted by um, one of a Harvard researcher um, who wanted to digitize a lot of Islamic works um, that were in Arabic because uh, a lot of the OCR and the technology wasn't there for, for Arabic text. It worked perfectly for English, you know, for PDFs and stuff. I bring it to Islamic text or like Arabic text and, you know, just, just didn't work. And so, you know, she was frustrated. It's like, why do I have to go to like Al-Azhar or go to Egypt or like go to these other places when, you know, I can, I can Google search this paper, but I can't do the same for Arabic work. And so there's, there's a lot of, 
um, basically technology that needs to be built in order to serve, you know, the Muslim Ummah, whether it's from, like you mentioned earlier, semantic search, being able to search the Quran uh, with with meaning, with, you know, and with context, so that, you know, let's say you search a certain verse, if you search that verse alone and you read it, you're going to have a completely different context when you read it alone versus when you understand the background, the sunnah behind it, the, the hadith associated with it, the tafsir and the associated translations. And so when you have that holistic understanding of like a verse or a certain story, you have a much clearer understanding of Islam, you know, not just for you as a Muslim, but also for non-Muslims as well. Because that's why you can get people people who, who are interested about Islam. Now they have a holistic and a proper understanding of of Islam because there was technology that helped them uh, better understand certain verses, certain hadith in certain contexts. And so there's there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, like we said, you know, outside the ecosystem terms from technological perspective, you know, building the tools for semantic search, building better assets for digitizing the Quran, uh, introducing new use cases for enhancing users' privacy. Uh, you know, like like I mentioned, uh, making when we put the Quran in, in, in a distributed format and a decentralized format, um, if you have access to internet in any way, shape, or form, you have access to like you know the blockchain network. That's it. You have access to the Quran. No one's going to tell you you can't. You can't. You know, not download this. No app store is going to tell you you can't do this. Like no, you already have access to it. So yeah. That's one of the most amazing things. That, uh, if we had more time, I would have loved to have delved into because, uh, man, uh, one of the some one of the questions I used to get asked early on in Fresh Grounded, and I think I have like maybe like a recording of a phone call that I had with somebody about this, was uh, why did you start Fresh Grounded and stuff like that, right? And um, I, the answer I would often give is that one of the th driving factors of Fresh Grounded was an ayah, and the ayah was that um, Allah doesn't change the condition of people until they change what is within themselves. Obviously, paraphrasing, and. Um, Actually, it was a lot later that one of the, one of the shayukh that we spoke to kind of gave me a different perception of that ayah and about how it how it may not specifically relate to what I'm uh, gonna say now, but the, what I'm gonna say is still relevant to kind of like why Fresh Uganda began, right? Which is that um, I had this thing where I I would see what's going on in China with the Uyghurs, um, and at the time I don't know if like it was specifically with like um, that community, but there was like definitely. Um, like th this, it, this treatment of Muslims was happening, right? And um, and then we were seeing obviously what was happening in India and stuff like that. And so like I would look at things like this and 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 Palestine. I would look at things like this and I would I would I would sometimes get uh, you know really uh, distraught or upset, uh, especially when it was things that were related to children as well. And I remember thinking to myself, like, how can I make a difference here, right? And then one of the things that I thought of is, is we know that Allah uh, can change anything, right? And maybe I can't specifically change what's going on in the world. But maybe if I can just uh, help to encourage individual people to make small changes within themselves, then I can I can leave Allah to, to, to make that change in the world. Uh, because if there's more people paying to Hajjad for those causes, or if there's more people now even just praying Fajr or being better Muslims, leaving off sin, that's going to have a direct impact on the world. And so my aim began began to be, let's create a podcast, for example, where there's Muslims who people relate to talking. And like one day someone will go, oh, I've listened to 100 episodes of Fresh and Grounded and I've realized that they've never sw uh, did, uh, said a swear word. Maybe I'll stop swearing now. Small change like that. Or maybe someone would decide to start praying Fajr. Or maybe someone will stop listening to music. And these diff little things seem little to us that they make a big difference in the world. And so hearing this about Tartil, and about how essentially making the Quran accessible to anybody and everybody, even people who is like, subhanAllah, like not even allowed to have access to the Quran, that is probably one of the most motivating things I think that like everybody can get behind. So that's really powerful. Uh, for the last 20 minutes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch everything up completely. And uh, so you guys may or may not know this. That we now that's gonna fall because it's, it was holding up the thing. But we have this uh, thing at Fresh Ground called the game. Have you guys heard of the game? Yep. Yeah. Well, I have I've, I've seen it on, uh, on your site. Yeah. <laughs> I have an open. Uh, we're actually discontinuing the game, and it is, uh, uh, which is also very sad because it's been like our flagship product since for about the last two years since COVID. We created it at a time where conversation was like really needed, right? And sometimes we play it with our guests. We played it with Mufti Mank. We did a whole segment on a live tour in front of like. Uh, about now, about 
10,000 audience members, live audience members, we played this game in Mufti Mank in like seven cities in the UK, right? Um, we played it with, oh, just like so many people. It's been amazing. I want to play it with you guys, but I want to play it with a twist, right? And so here's how we're going to do it. Uh, I'm not going to involve, I'm just going to sit back and watch. You guys are going to, as uh, colleagues, as co-founders, you're going to uh, open up to each other, find out more about each other. And the way you're going to do it is in a, uh, a situation that feels only right for, for this podcast, and that is uh, digitally, right? And so what we've done, people don't know this, is we actually have a web app version of the game, which is private. I'm going to send that to you guys now. Um, so you guys can open that up. Have you guys received it? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a web app version of the game. Uh, it's a private version. It's not accessible uh, or known uh, to the public. And I want Anas to start, and you can choose who you're going to ask the question to, right? And we're going to go uh, Anas, Aqil, Mohammed. We're just going alphabetically here. And uh, it's really, the, the, the rules of the game are two. One is uh, be vulnerable, and the other is don't judge. And the point of that is that there's, other than that, there's no rules. So... I prefer to play in a way where whatever card you get, you get and you ask the question, right? But I can't control uh, what you guys are seeing on your screen. So you're welcome to pick a card that you like or just pick a card at random. Uh, but I think for the next, well now like, you know, 17 minutes, it'll be lovely to get to know the people behind Tertil uh, for, for me more than anything. So I'm being selfish here. So Anas, I'm going to hand it over to you. I'll clear you next. And uh, you're more than welcome to throw me in if you need to. Uh, if you want to ask me a question, but uh, I'm going to hand it over to you guys. So, Anas, the floor is yours. Should I share the screen, like so people can also see the question, or uh, I'm no? Just just right read now. out the just read out the question. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, so, in what ways are you a difficult question? In what ways are you a difficult person? Maybe. Uh, I guess. I mean, it says, but not always a difficult question. But yeah. Uh, that would be that would be a typo because the question is in what way is a difficult person? <laughs> yeah, that would be a bug, yeah. Oh, the digital world. Um, yeah. So um, okay, that that's actually a uh, question that you can actually answer yourself if you want, or you can ask Aqil, I guess. I think yeah, ask it to Aqil. Let's 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 go like that. Let's go ask each other the question. So, is that the question you're going with? Yeah, maybe that's the question I have. Aqil, in what ways are you a difficult person? A difficult person. Um, I'm quite, uh, so this is a feedback that I get quite often, is uh, I'm too blunt. And people sometimes take that honesty uh, as an offense. Um, so I guess that would be the, the biggest uh, feedback that I've gotten from individuals is that, that I need to kind of like tone down the, the feedback in a regard that's a bit more palatable and conscious of their feelings. Uh, so this is probably something you'll learn quite early on is <laughs> when when you're getting feedback from me is very straight to the point and I'm not taking uh, your feelings into account but uh, that's just how I've always functioned and hopefully inshallah uh, I can improve a little bit there great okay go ahead your question your time to ask a question um, oh sorry you can choose who you ask it to sorry hey, you know what I'm gonna I'm gonna loop you in because you put us in this awkward situation okay, so fine. what are you not being honest <laughs> what are you not being honest with yourself about? <laughs> oh, I'm not being honest with myself. That's a tough question. I always find that tough to answer. Um, I think, uh, again, if you base it on feedback, what I found, and, and the great thing about these questions is that you kind of give a different answer depending on uh, the, the like which point in your life you're at. And so the one that like springs to mind right now is... Um, I had a chat with... Seth Godin a few weeks ago and he was talking about re reassurance, not seeking reassurance and uh, that kind of hit me quite a lot because it seems to be a common theme that comes up in my life where it's like just go with something. Every time you go with something and you attack it, um, things tend to work out well and if they don't, you learn from it very quickly and you pick yourself up. So rather than seeking a too much approval or reassurance, just go for it. So I think what I'm not being honest with myself about is that I can just, um, I should just attack things with speed because I've built up a, a, a an experience level and a skill set that I should be more confident in perhaps. So it sounds somewhat like, you know, praise praising of yourself, but I think that's my honest answer right now. 
So talking about reassurance, one thing that I did, did want to interject with at some point in the podcast was kind of commending you on this freshly grounded brand oh, and uh, the, 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 the kind of like the, the core principle behind it, because it's one of the biggest issues that we do have in the Muslim community is we don't have good uh, role models from a young Muslim, especially from a male perspective or even from a female perspective for people to kind of latch on to. I think you're providing that community and that area for individuals to find like-minded individuals. And similarly, I feel like tech is basically the new rock stars and for the next decade or two or people being able to create technology. And we want to be able to create communities and create resources where people do have good role models and good individuals to kind of like attach themselves to. And the, the amazing thing with internet and the, the way that technology is, Web3, et cetera, are developing is like, you don't need any credentials. You don't need anyone to tell you that you're good enough. You can go in and create value for your community. You just need to be able to uh, have some sort of uh, confidence in that, that you're going to be successful. And even if you're not successful, you learn something at the end of the day. And that's, that's the, the biggest value. So like, even I was having a conversation with uh, a community that we're trying to put together for Muslim open source contributors. And the biggest question was about this, um, what do they call it? Imposter syndrome. It's like, yes. Yeah. How do you get involved in these projects? If you, if you don't have the experience, you don't know the community, you don't know the individuals. It's like, go ahead, give it a shot. What's the worst that could happen? Like yeah. you're behind a screen, there's certain security <laughs> kind of baked into this. Uh, but beyond that, like you meet individuals, like we're all remote, like right now, like we're creating something together, but we're sitting like thousands of miles apart. And it's a beautiful opportunity for your community, whether it's in the uh, whether it's in the YouTube comments or Twitter or whatever, to kind of reach out and see where you can find that core tribe uh, for you to create change, whether it's in your immediate community, your expansive community, et cetera. So I think it, it was an amazing uh, opportunity to kind of highlight some of those points in relation to Freshly Grounded. So Thank you very much. It. I really appreciate that. I appreciate that. And the sentiment is... Uh, is uh, duplicated on my part uh mohammed over to you and you can choose uh -oh. who you ask the question to go ahead okay let me uh, take a look at the questions all right uh anas what has been tough today but i uh I'm, I'm, I'm worried I'm going to give another technical answer here, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you're not allowed to talk about anything that you did for Tartil today. Any any technical? No, maybe Mohammed answered that question because he hasn't had the opportunity to answer. So I know you had a wasp situation yesterday, but what happened today since you are in Turkey? <laughs> yeah, so uh, sure, I, I, can, uh, I can answer that. Uh, I've been uh, traveling in, uh, in Turkey recently and uh, I have to say, uh, it's been a very uh, interesting experience for me. For anyone who, who doesn't know me, I've not I've had the chance to travel a fair bit. I've gone to maybe 17, 18 countries or something at this point now. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very lucky to have I've had that opportunity. And uh, everywhere you go, like uh, some of those countries have been, you know, Muslim countries, some of them have not been. And uh, it's always really interesting to see uh, the behavior of the people around you. Uh, and how you go and, and, and seek out, you know, Islamic ideals in, in whatever land you're living in. And uh, I think that's one of the things I've, uh, I've had trouble with uh, in part of my trip uh, is that I find myself in a very touristy area of, of Turkey right now, where a lot of the people that I've been uh, interacting with are not Muslim. It's, and that's kind of my standard day-to-day -day life in Canada. The majority of the people in, in the community are not Muslim, obviously. Um, but it's weird when you're like sitting in a, in a, environment where you know you hear that then around you and you see the beautiful message and all that kind of stuff and at the same time like you, you see things that don't align with your islamic ideals or, or, or you're having trying to navigate certain situations especially like if you're you know i'm in it right now like i'm in a beach town and stuff like that so it, you know the way people are dressed some of the actions that people are taking and stuff like that at the beach uh is obviously not not in alignment with islamic values it's a uh, it's it's a uh, you know, you have a very Western European audience who's here and, and, and they're behaving with, you know, their, their kind of cultural background. So that's been very tough for me. Like, I think that there's always uh, a lot of Muslims have this ideal of like seeking out an Islamic land where they go and live and everything is going to kind of be perfect. 
and you're going to live in a bubble. And uh, that's certainly, you know, the, my experience today, for example, or like where I currently am, Turkey has not been my experience for for all of Turkey. And certainly Turkey is, is a beautiful country with uh, with people, uh, you know, who are practicing some in many places. But um, I think people need to learn to kind of interact with the environment that's around them and with, you know, the, the reality that uh, unfortunately, you know, we have not achieved the point where, you know, the, the whole world can live in a perfect khilafa and everything like that. And so that's always tough for me is like uh, trying to kind of balance my expectations. Uh, you know, you can't just like land somewhere and be like, hey, I'm finally in a Muslim country. Now everything's going to be 100% halal. You know, everyone is going to be dressed perfectly. And, you know, everything, the way people are conducting themselves can be perfectly honest and truthful and welcoming and, you know, all the perfect Islamic ideals that you might seek out. The reality is it's, it's not it's not like that. You know, I've never been to any place where it's it's been like that. Uh, and I don't think I, I ever will, uh, unfortunately. However, you know, there's degrees and, and you can always continue to get better and you can always work with the community to try to make the community better. So that's been tough, but uh, it's, uh, it's, you know, just a reality of, I guess, where we are. And and as you, I don't think you can you're not allowed to get away with that uh, without answering that. So what's been tough about today? <laughs> non technical answer. I'll give a technical answer just for 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 giggles. Um, I need to process seventeen million audio files, so I need to find a way to do that. So that's that's my difficult technical challenge today. Um, <laughs> on on the non technical side, um, I mean I'm done. This morning has been pretty good. Today has been pretty good. Maybe. Uh, in general, this is probably like something other people have been struggling with is uh, marriage and like understanding like the whole process behind it. Okay, um, now we're getting yeah, somewhere. Now we're getting yeah. gas. Let's talk about marriage. It's always yeah. interesting. <laughs> the, so I mean, I've, I've had like, you know, uh, on and off uh, stints basically looking and not looking and then, you know, using like traditional means or versus like, you know, using Moz or like Sedans or any of those apps. Um, and so every every experience has been um, eye opening in the sense like you learn something new when you get to meet someone else, um, especially when you dive deep into like your own um, insights. You real you start to learn things about your own behaviors and you start to learn things like other people might have. And so, like I found like for example like you know it I found it very hard to you know try and understand and align with like um with with other people especially when it comes to like building like a partnership or a relationship like for me it i found it easy to do it from like a, a business perspective you know alhamdulillah like mm -hmm. you know i'm i'm privileged and honored to have like Aqid and Muhammad, um you know as like partners and co-founders you know as as Tarsid. um but a life partner is something completely different and so um i think understanding like the nuances and the mechanics of of that is uh I don't, I don't call it difficult. It's just been like a journey, basically. And so working, working through like all that has been, yeah. Do you so feel I like you, you process thoughts uh, as a developer, even in, even in real life? And that can get in the way of the, uh, the human side of things. Does that make oh, sense? Yeah. I'm not trying, not trying to say you're yeah. a robot, but I'm saying you're, you've obviously, you're obviously incredibly, <laughs> you're incredibly intelligent. You're incredibly intelligent, Lombardi, in 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 this field, and your work has proven that. And I can, and you you clearly are really all in with your work. Um, and so I can imagine that that takes you down a line of thought and a way of thinking that could be perhaps very logical and also very problem solving. And I'm interested to know how that uh, impacts your non uh digital life yeah no, so i would just I like mean, to throw i i, I would I'm, like to throw one thing here which is that uh you know ns has some background in robotics and his emoji of choice is a robot so uh, <laughs> if you call him a robot i don't think he will even get too offended there <laughs> yeah okay fine yeah uh, no but I, oh yeah my i started my developer journey like working with robots i i played with the robots i interact with the robots you know i'm People call me a robot sometimes, you know, just because like the line of thought uh, and process. Um, and so, um, 
yeah it's uh it does it does affect your the way you think because like when you when you talk with a computer basically when you're telling it what you want it to do and doesn't you know you know doesn't do what you want it to do like you start thinking in terms of like if and else and you know black and white there's no like it's it's all binary there's no gray area and so um you know kind of like to his point like when you when you talk with someone or you you give them like a situation like sometimes i i don't recognize that but then people tell me it's like you're very methodical and you're very like you know um if this then that uh kind of like person even like my personality trait took like a a test once and I got like a logistician. So the guy is like always thinking like logically, you know, thinking like, you know, in terms of like sequences and processes and whatnot. And so, you know, some people are, are fine with that, but some people like, you know, they're, they're more serendipitous, they're more outgoing and engaging. And so it's been very interesting to see like other like behaviors and whatnot, like especially when they communicate with Muhammad, Muhammad is like another engineer. And so we, we always have this like, you know, if this works, then we do that. If that doesn't work, we do this. And so, uh, we we kind of have that, that thinking and thought process, but it does it does affect the way you engage with other people, and sometimes it you know subconsciously like you don't, you don't think about it. So yeah. I'm sure I'm sure it enhances it because I've only I in the short time I've known you I only know good of you, so uh, that's uh, is is not always a bad thing. Um, I. Uh, uh, to be fair, by the way, like you know, it it can be a bad thing. So I don't know if you saw of the probably too much context needs to be given but like you know sometimes i might dive into things that are like might be very technically interesting or engaging but could be um from like maybe a personal or a Islamic perspective like uh questionable or you know something that you should avoid and so my my scientist brain or my you know my engineering brain sometimes gets the better of me and so you know there's there's a balance that needs to be has to be, has to be played there so yeah i'll, I'll end up i'll end this by saying uh that mentioning that you're uh, in the market for marriage is a very dangerous thing to say on Freshly Grounded because <laughs> Freshly Grounded is Freshly Grounded is often treated as a marriage platform. We get like, we'll have a guest on and we get so many emails from people saying like, can you like, is this person married? Is, are they interested in marriage? Like, and then we all of a sudden become like a marriage platform. So we try and avoid those emails. Please but... our inbox. So <laughs> that's a... already yeah, I, I, so... I apologize for that. I'm not, by the way, I'm not on Buzz. I'm not on Salams anymore. So there's no like marketing campaign there. Like find me on Buzz or something. So five, five, five. <laughs> just we'll, just I... in case my wife listens to this podcast, I would like to say clearly, I I'm happily married. And, and the lock, you know, if I... <laughs> uh, no, no messages for me. <laughs> They're going to be pouring it either way. Akhil, any statements you want to make before we end the podcast? Uh, I just want to say appreciative of the opportunity and the platform that you've given us and the complex amount of individuals. Um, we are doing a lot of work on the back end, trying to curate and help curate communities that kind of come in and uh, get involved with some of this technology. So like from a Web3 perspective, I'm part of a group called DAWA. Uh, so it's like a DAO, the DAWA um, that you guys can kind of like reach out to if you're interested in learning about Web3 from like a chronic nerdy. technology. Yeah, so from a, the chronic perspective, we have like a Discord community for cron.com. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we're also trying to help kickstart like a Muslim open source community. So we're trying to create more opportunities for individuals who are excited about this stuff. Um, so if you're ever interested or if you've had these ideas and you don't really know how to get started, feel free to reach out to us via Twitter, Instagram, whatever channels that Fansel is going to be mostly active on. And then uh, we'll put you in the right place and the right individuals to kind of help you kickstart that. But there should be like, if you've, if you've had that like small inkling of, hey, maybe I should do this, like do reach out and we'll try to do our best to kind of like help you engage with the community and learn more and at least get some more visibility to it. Because that's one of the challenges with the Islamic Ummah is that I feel like we're being left behind. There's 2 billion people and we haven't innovated on what it means to be a Muslim for such a long time. And it's really about time that we start thinking about how to leverage the technology and how to really relate it to our lives and what it means to be a Muslim. So like even from a, a grander perspective, like if we did have the opportunity to go in some more um, like tangents, I would have loved to dive into like how Islam can how technology can actually help you understand Islam better from a perspective of like, hey, we're told that you're going to have this book that has your whole record. If you, When we were growing up, that was like such a far-fetched idea. Now everything of yours is logged, all your data is secured, et cetera. Like your whole life is mapped out. So like how, how far-fetched it is, is it for you to now like 
go to the judgment day and then there's a book that has all your data and it's verifiable. There's, there's all this information that is presented of your doings. And aside from that, like all this technology is like helping us become closer to, to religion and vice versa. Religion is now opening our eyes as far as like how we can leverage it and how we can improve technology for the lives of others, individuals as well. So there's like, there's so much opportunities for people to get involved here and create value, not only for us, not only for Muslims, but for the the world that is around us. And it's a, it's a sad sight to see where we kind of stay today. And hopefully there's more focus and more energies uh, that kind of help us kind of move that needle forward, inshallah. Amazing. Uh, and I would just like to end by saying um, kind of on a, on a uh, publicly to you guys, uh, that it's been an absolute pleasure uh, joining the team and um, you know uh, the, the, the welcome has been so warm and uh, I couldn't have thought of a, a better team of um, a better team to both be involved with and to and to look forward to working with uh, inshallah over the over the, the course of the future so um, thank you guys again thank you for jumping on fresh ground and giving me your time uh, on this platform and uh, I hope that uh, I, I pray that Allah puts barakah in the project uh, in all of our projects and I ask the viewers and the listeners of this podcast uh, to also make the uh for the team and for the efforts of the team because there's some amazing work being done and I think that it's a uh, uh, something that's very much so needed. Amen. Jazakallah um, khair, guys. I'll see you very shortly. Thank you so much, uh, to everyone who listened to this episode of the podcast, and we'll see you, we'll see you again, inshallah, next week. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>